afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Hegarty, and I'm head of the School of Medical Sciences. And that's about all I'm going to say. Um, the uh, School of Medical Sciences is actually quite a large enterprise. It's the size of a, a medical school. We have a thousand staff and a budget of over 100 million. Not that I ever see anything other than about 10 pounds of that. Um, we, what's that, Tim? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's changed since you were in And um, we have six divisions, uh, and uh, the school is also responsible for um, the undergraduate dental program and the undergraduate medical student program. And cancer sciences, the division where we are today is one of the jewels in our crown. And this afternoon is a, 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 a celebration. Um, what we have are inaugural lectures of, of our new professors. And uh, it's a great privilege to be here to share the celebration with you. And to get into the detail, when you have a division of cancer sciences, uh, you need the leader of the division. And so it's a great honor to invite uh, Professor Stephen Taylor to introduce both of the speakers. So, Stephen. Thank you, Tony, and thank you for coming down to join us today for this, uh, yeah, as Tony says, a celebration. So, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to see family, friends, and very close colleagues of uh, the two superstars that you have uh, sitting here in front of you today. And, uh, yeah, as the head of Cancer Sciences Division, it's my pleasure to... Uh, introduce both of them. So we have two fantastic lectures today, first from uh, Marcel Van Herk and then from uh, James O'Connor. And uh, yeah, it's my, it's my honour today to really introduce both of them to you. Um, and yeah, what can I say about uh, these two? Let's start off with Marcel. Um, Marcel started his career in Amsterdam, where he uh, first studied physics and got his bachelor's degree in, in physics from the University of Amsterdam. He then became interested in medical physics and joined the Netherlands Cancer Institute where he studied for his uh, master's and then his PhD. After a short uh, stint at Harvard Medical School, Marcel returned uh, to Amsterdam in 1993 where he became group leader again at the uh, Netherlands Cancer Institute. Um, and in 2004, Marcel was appointed a professor of medical physics in the department, the medical physics department at the University of Amsterdam but of course in 2015, uh, we poached Marcel and we uh, encouraged him to move here and become uh, chair in radiotherapy physics here in Manchester. So, as you can probably guess from some of the terminology I've been using so far, Marcel's research focuses on improving the accuracy of radiotherapy through data mining and image-based guidance. And over the last 30 years of his career or so, uh, Marcel has made enormous contributions to his field. Now, I could go on about publications and grants and, and prizes and so on. What I'm really going to do is highlight two key things which I think really illustrates the impact uh, Marcel's uh, research has had on uh, cancer patients. So the first is that he has a formula named after him. The <laughs> Van Herk margin formula uh, is used widely to plan radiation uh, therapy treatments. And also, you know, not just as, a, as an academic, but you know, Marcel's also worked very closely with companies that make radiotherapy instruments. And Marcel has played a major role in developing the technology that is now used in several thousand instruments, these instruments around the world. And I think the latest estimates are that some six million patients have been treated with instruments that have been uh, helped develop with Marcel's uh, technology, which I think is really quite fantastic. So, welcome Marcel, and I very much look forward to our convention. Thank you, Tony, for this, uh, this uh, very nice introduction. And obviously, I've got to talk about uh, the work that I'm doing, and it's, it's about learning for every patient treated. So, this is. Oh, where is the space bar? Try to think in front of you, Marcel. Oh. Yeah, try that. Very good. 
see the robes, so the robes are maybe now a little bit more frayed than 40 years ago, and I might, myself might be a little bit more frayed, but, uh, but yeah, the, this, is, this is how science goes and how, how life goes. And uh, actually the, the entourage of my first inaugural lecture is the, uh, the aula of the University of Amsterdam, which is actually a functioning church, which is, which is quite nice. So I work in radiotherapy, and not all of you may, might be aware of what radiotherapy entails, but basically we have a patient who is diagnosed with, uh, with cancer and then the patient is, gone, is, is taken through a scanner to identify where the tumor is. And then a poor doctor needs to sit on a, on a computer screen uh, or at the computer screen and outline the location of the tumor. And then typically a physicist or a specialized uh, radiotherapist would plan the treatment such that when beams are shot through the tumor, they add up to a high dose in the tumor, <coughs> sparing the, the octet risk around the tumor as much as possible. The problem, of course, then comes trying to execute this because we have a treatment machine that shoots invisible beams and we're trying to hit something that's inside the body so it's invisible to us. So we need imaging to make this better and that's my field. Now, the field of, of imaging and radiotherapy, the idea of imaging and radiotherapy has been around for a long time. So this is a beautiful example of a cobalt irradiation machine built in Amsterdam uh, at the Netherlands Cancer Institute, which included imaging. There's an x-ray imaging source over here, and there is a video camera over there, and that basically allows you to look inside the patient before treatment. Unfortunately, there were no computers around there, so, so even though this system would allow the operator to look at the screen, there was not very much quantitative that you could do with the information. So this is a modern treatment machine, and what you see is the treatment head over here, which shoots beams through the patient, and uh, in the beam of the treatment head is an, an imager which can be used to QA the treatment. Now there is a second imager which is an x-ray source and an x-ray panel which is used for scanning the patient and gives better image quality. And both imaging systems are used for image guidance and I've worked on both imaging systems. So this is my first project. Um, and I was the photo model right there. It's a little bit older than, uh, than, uh, than just a couple of years. It's been around for uh, 33 years, uh, more than 33 years. And uh, together with uh, electronics guy uh, Jan de Gans and my supervisor Ben Meinheer, I worked on developing a detector that sits in the treatment beam and allows you to visualize what's going on in the patient uh, during treatment. So this is a, an image of a head and neck treatment. You see the neck over here, you can see the vertebrae and maybe a little bit of the jaw and the skull. And this is a lung treatment and this is maybe the very, very first movie loop that was made of a breathing patient because the electronic imager could take images one after each other. Well, with film before that, that was not possible. So this is imager number one. Imager number two uh, was more, I was more focused on the software, the hardware I developed previously. The software was needed for this device. We got a prototype from the company Electa of this X-ray imaging system, and that prototype came without uh, appropriate software. But I had already written a lot of software for the old imager and for other systems, and by combining that, we could make a system that could make a CT scan of the patient in a couple of minutes, allowing you to look inside the patient and then target the irradiation as accurate as possible. And uh, indeed, Tony already said it, over 6 million pe people have been treated with this equipment alone. And uh, for instance, it has been used to increase local control of the tumor. For instance, if you have lung treatments of small tumors, you can give them a very high dose and precisely target that and get uh, 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 over 90% control of the tumor locally. And then if the tumor hasn't spread, that, that, is, that is excellent for, of course, patients will live quite a long time after that but also to reduce toxicity, because if you can target more accurately, you need you can spare the organ risks that are right next to the tumor better, and in that way reduce toxicity. And obviously I didn't do this alone, I did it with many of my colleagues. Um, Harry Bartonik was instrumental in, uh, in, in setting up the context with the industry, and then at uh, Peter and Jan Jakob, of course, together we developed uh, all this the methodology. 
but these systems are still around. They, they are the state of the art in, in radiotherapy. And actually, uh, there, there is still work to be done on these systems. And uh, I, I can hear my colleagues laughing about the, the pictures because they are made on the, during parties and stuff. <laughs> so, so one thing is that you have these images, and then you need very clear protocols on how you're going to use those images. And that's, that's, that's tricky because, the, because uh, when, when you can imagine the patient is on a treatment machine, you make a scan, and you have to make judgment on how you're going to make, modify the treatment very quickly. And uh, so to do that, you have to have like workbooks for the operators, and those workbooks still need development. And this is for a situation, again, of very fast treatment of a lung cancer. If you have a tiny tumor over here, everything is all right. You irradiate that with a small beam and uh, nothing to worry about. But the treatment happens on many days, and on another day, what can happen is that the tumor has moved, and now it's actually very close to a bowel loop. And if you would treat that tumor the same way, you could cause a, a very severe damage to the bowel. So this needs to be detected by the operators, but also in such a way that we don't lose a lot of time. And that is where the protocol development comes in. If we treat children, people are always very worried about the imaging dose that you apply. And so Abby and Josh, uh, under the supervision of Jill, are working on technology to reduce the imaging dose, for instance, making a new filter. And uh, Abby has, has been doing this for uh, x-ray treatment and Josh is now repeating the same thing for, for, for proton therapy, where uh, obviously a lot of children are now treated in the Christi. And then the, the, the next kit on the block is MR-guided radiotherapy. And uh, MR-guided radiotherapy basically means that the treatment machine is integrated with an MR scanner. And the beauty of an MR scanner is that you get much nicer images. This is a coma CT image. It's quite noisy. It's difficult to see the internal anatomy. And on the MR, you can see much more contrast. And the, uh, that system has just been taken into use at the Christie, but, uh, but there is lots of work to be done. So we've got a bunch of MR physicists, doctors, uh, uh, radiographers, and physicists working on optimizing this system. And, uh, and, and, and that is definitely necessary because now, currently, the protocols that are used to treat the patients are just too time consuming. A single treatment fraction on these machines takes anywhere between half an hour and maybe an hour and that is not sustainable in the long term, so we need to improve that. But I am actually not only interested now in, in the delivery of the treatment, I'm also interested in the outcome, because there are issues that image guidance precisely targeting the treatment does not solve. For instance, if you ask multiple doctors to outline the target, doctors don't agree amongst each other. And even if you ask the same doctor to outline the target twice, you will not get uh, precisely the same answer. So we need to improve the training and the peer review of uh, the targeting. And we work together with the Royal Co College of Radiographers and several companies to, to develop that. And these are students uh, working in this field. <coughs> then there are tumor deposits that we know they are there. If you don't treat a larger area around the tumor, the tumor comes back. But we cannot visualize them. So we need to have statistical knowledge on how to do that. And, uh, and for instance, with, uh, with, with Hema in the audience, we looked at, we look, looked at that area, uh, that topic. Uh, then we have poorly known toxicity thresholds. We, we want to hit the target very hard, but we know that we have to back off of the oxidative risk. But if we, if we don't know how much we can back off, or then we, do, we either treat the patients wrong because we, the tumor comes back, or we treat the patient wrong because the oxidative risks are damaged. And so it's a very delicate balance, and we need to figure out what that balance is. So classically, we actually know this from retrospective data and uh, clinical experience. These, these things are not tested, typically not tested out in clinical trials, and we want to do that better. We want to learn from every patient treated. And that means that we need to have a lot of data. And the beauty was when I arrived in the Christie, uh, Garrett Price was already working on building a system to collect all the Christie data, and now we have a beautiful environment where we can just get ethics permission very quickly and analyze retrospective data to learn from every patient treated. And also Jason here, again at a party, is, uh, is uh, doing data management uh, for, a, for a large data cohort. So now the problem is we, we collect all this data, but how do we understand what to do with this data? It's really a problem because you get like a thousand images of a thousand patients. And what does that mean? So you need to develop the methodology to, uh, to analyze those images, and that methodology needs to be uh, very accurate, needs to be very efficient, 
And basically, it, doesn't, it should not be uh, dependent on assumptions, because if you assume that a certain organ is, is critical, then maybe you've, you've got it wrong. So what we do is we take here, as a movie loop, the images of thousands of patients, and we align them all to a standard patient, a template patient. And that allows us to take the beams of all the patients that have been treated, so, so the white lines are the beams of the patients being treated, and map that, those into standard space. And then we take the patients uh, which were alive one year after treatment, in this case for lung cancer, and the patients that are dead after one year uh, tre treatment, and we see whether there is any difference in the treatment. So we average all the beams of the patients that are alive and all the beams of the patients that, that are dead, and then we subtract them, and then we see there is a tiny black dot. The black dot means that the patients that are dead got more dose in a particular region. And what does this mean? Well, you need to develop the statistics, which is very often trivially, because you're looking at a lot of data at once. So we have our group is doing that. And so here you see uh, an example of the, our big data and data mining. On the left-hand side, you see uh, what came out of the analysis I just explained. So there is a little spot in the top of the heart where a higher dose means that patients die quicker. And we don't really know what that means. So we, now we are translating this, back translating it into small animal research. Do we know what's going wrong when we treat that area? And we're also doing patient studies where we're imaging patients, and, and, and Catherine, our group, has just started imaging those patients, and uh, uh, where we're looking at whether we can see any changes in the function of the heart of those patients. Beauty is we can validate it in other cohorts, and we, we're also developing lots of new methodology. So Alan is the main guy doing the data mining. Andrew is developing the methodology. And, uh, and Azade here is working on, on applying this data in other cohorts. Uh, so we just got thousands of patients from Leeds to work with. Now, beautiful other finding is from Corinne Johnson. She looked at data from patients that were treated in the Christie. And she found out that there are tiny inaccuracies in how the heart is positioned during treatment things that we would think nothing on, maybe a millimeter to the left and a millimeter to the right. And what she found, and that won her uh, the prestigious Best Abstract Award in a very big conference last year, is that patients where there is a minute shift towards the heart of the therapy do significantly worse uh, in survival than patients where the shift is the other direction. So that means that we need to be accurate in targeting, but it also means that we underestimate the damage that we give to the, these patients. So we need to know more about dose constraints and need to refine them. And, uh, and we're doing that right now. Then we need to exploit imaging and bi biological parameters. So we're working together with the biologist, uh, Catherine West, and, uh, and we're looking uh, at imaging data. And again, we are winning lots of awards. So the people that are working there here are students. And uh, uh, Angela just won the, the, uh, the Rising Star competition in Montreal two weeks ago. And, uh, and obviously that was the reason for a big party, because she showed that, uh, a better way of analyzing the 4D data that we collect for the patient, so a time series data. And Azade just won an award in ASTRO, the best of physics lecture, uh, for looking at the effect of white blood cells in the blood. And if you lose white blood cells, how does, how, what, what triggers that? And what effect does it have on patient survival? <coughs> And again, uh, a very important finding because now currently we are looking into immune therapy. So uh, damage of the immune system is very important. And this is the first time that we link physical dose delivered with uh, that kind of damage. And that gives us a, like a sensor with which we can, we are changing the immune system or we change the immune system in patient treated in the past. And we can see whether that interacts with, with future immune therapy. So what is our greatest weakness in radiotherapy? Well, that's basically that the biology is, is very poorly known. Uh, I showed the example of where the tumor is delineated with different doctors, and they, they, they disagree. But also, uh, there is motion in the patients, which, uh, which, which should be showing on this movie, which run before, but it doesn't now. <laughs> and so basically, the, this, this, this movie shows that there is internal anatomy moving during treatment. So currently, radiotherapy uses safety margins to deal with these issues. And safety margins basically means you, that you want to hit the target, but you know that, that you don't do that perfectly accurate, so you're actually going to hit a little bit more. And you can imagine that that's bad for the patient, because, because if you hit more, then you have more damage. But if you don't hit enough, you miss. And that's a delicate balance. 
And so, indeed, there is a margin recipe uh, called after me, the Van Hark recipe, and I just went onto the internet, looked for a picture, and thought, oh, well, apparently, apparently they're teaching that in China as well. So this is just a Chinese slide showing my equation. I have no idea what it says, but this is so, so, so margins are great, they're cool, and I'm very famous for them, but, but actually, they are not the only way of dealing with it. And there is an international uh, radio therapy protocol, the ICD <coughs> protocol, and there's a statement here that, there that says that basically margins are a tool to make sure that the target is, is, is treated with an acceptable pro probability. But, but actually, what I, I wrote this statement, so that's the nice thing. What I meant to say is this is not the only tool. So we need to build smarter tools, and that's, that's something that we're working on right now. So, and that's called probabilistic planning, and it's a bit complicated, but basically we have uncertainties, we have day-to-day -day movement of the target, we have systematic uncertainties, the doctors that don't agree, so one doctor will treat slightly different than the other, and we have biological uncertainties. And what we are now doing is we're collecting the error bars of all this information and putting those error bars into the treatment planning system. And the beauty of that is that you can take something that is very complicated, model it and simulate it, and then create treatment plans that are compatible with these uncertainties without having to derive yet another margin recipe. And, and because those margin recipes are bloody complicated, and actually we don't know them for all the other uncertainties. But we can build this planning system, and here Andrew and Jenny and Eliana are, are working on building these planning systems, and, uh, and well, that's, that, that's ongoing. So I started working on that when I was at NKI. So this is a slide from Marnix Witte in NKI. And basically it shows the effect of probabilistic planning if you have a treatment where there are only physical uncertainties. So we have here a, a lateral view, a side view of a patient. And the target here is the prostate. And the critical structure is the rectum, the bowel. You don't want to hit the rectum too hard. So what does probabilistic planning do? It does something that's totally logical. It takes those away from the rectum. So in the probabilistic plan, you see the red shifts towards this side. And to compensate for that loss of dose, it adds the dose somewhere else. Totally logical, but impossible to achieve with, if you don't have, the, uh, if have that information into the treatment planning system. <coughs> and the same thing we can do with protein therapy, where we don't know the biological effect. We can do it with, with, with biological models, which are made using information based on, on a limited number of patients. By taking the error bars into account, we can use that information. Well, before we said, well, the information is just too bad, we can't use it. So, so I think this is a very exciting uh, development. And it links in perfectly with the big data, because the big data allows us to get this information, plus the error bars, and then this is how to use it in treatment planning. So what are we doing more? Well, we are working on rapid learning and imaging biomarkers. Rapid learning means that we create a learning cycle, and Garrett and Marianne and Corinne are working on that. And basically what it means is that we take information from the clinic as it is ongoing, we analyze the data, make a small change, for instance, in the dose constraint to the heart, and then look on the, on, uh, on the patients that are treated uh, after that small change, whether we see an improvement in outcome. And now the beauty is, is that in the crystal we treat so many patients, that, for instance, we can do this in about a year's time. We can statistically prove that, indeed, the treatment has improved, or hopefully not deteriorated. But it's not impossible, because we don't know everything. And this is like an alternative to clinical trials. We can very quickly uh, change the <coughs> practice, small stats at a time, and see how the outcome changes. And if we can get this done, and we are now writing the grants to do this, this is a major change, and this would be probably the first application of rapid learning in true clinical practice. And radiotherapy is so beautiful, is that you have all the data and you can do this uh, very nicely. Another thing that we need to do is we need to look at our patients. Are our patients, how healthy are our patients? Now the doctor asks, can you walk up the stairs? Okay, that, that gives information. But if we have already scan information, we can look at the scans and, and Andrew has built a neural network to, to find the, the, the muscle in the scans and if the muscle is wasted, if it's invaded by fat, we know the patients are less healthy. And that is very predictive for outcome of the, of the patients. So this is an imaging biomarker. And James, after me, is going to talk about the development of imaging biomarkers. And I'm very keen on developing imaging biomarkers on data that we already have and that we collect in clinical practice. Because it means we can do a better job treating our patients without having extra procedures and without having extra cost. And even maybe taking a little less time. 
So that already brings me to my conclusions. I think there has been a revolution in hardware and software that has given radiotherapy an unprecedented position, but in the physics of delivery, we know exactly what, what we're going to hit if we, if we target it. But the biological uh, things are not so well known. Those uncertainties remain. We don't know exactly what to hit. We don't know uh, exactly what to spare. And that's where the data revolution, the big data, is helping us. It allows us to learn from every patient treated. And our group is at the front forefront of doing this kind of analysis. And then the beauty is, again, we are collecting all that information, but now we need to apply that information to clinical practice. So we are building new treatment planning tools that can use this information in a rational way. And uh, I mean rational, it's not, you know, doctors are great, but they have to make a decision. But, it's, but often it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's guesswork. Should we treat a little bit more, a little bit less? If we use all the information properly, we can make rational decisions about that. But that means that we have to take into account that that information is not perfect. So what is needed for success? Well, the first thing that's needed for success is collaboration. That means that we go out to dinner, for instance, here at, uh, at a big conference, which is very important, but it also means that we all work together. The doors are always open, and we talk and discuss all the developments all the time. Then, obviously, I'm a physicist, but I can't do my work without brilliant clinicians that are interested in the development. And we've got here Ananya and Corinne Ferverfin that, that are really brilliant in linking us up with, with the clinic. And that, that's what we needed. And these are a very, very rare commodity. The, the doctors that are really interested in, in this kind of research, you can count them on the fingers of, of one hand, maybe in Europe. And uh, we're lucky to have two and a number of young ones growing up. Then obviously we need a good chief, uh, Rob Bristow, working here with uh, Corinne uh, and, uh, and uh, Rebecca on, uh, on the grant that we just got granted, uh, the Rudnet grant, and good mentors in the form of Tim, who, who made sure that I could come here, Ram, who links us with the clinical physics department, and Peter, who is now chairing the RRR group, where we're all sitting together and working together. But obviously, even if we have that, we still need something more, and that is very good data support. And my uh, secretary, uh, uh, Rebecca, uh, project manager, Kim, and Rebecca, there's too many Rebeccas, uh, <laughs> and you, you see us here just uh, submitting an EU project, an enormous amount of work, and with, with enormous help of these people, we've managed to submit it, and hopefully it will be funded. We're not sure about that. But not, of, not everything is rosy. And uh, I know the heads of school and, uh, and the faculty are... I think, careful now, careful. <laughs> I will be, I will be. But I'm being honest, I think. But I think the university is an excellent organization. There are, there are so many good things, courses, outreach events, where we always show us up. And, and that's brilliant. What is not so brilliant is that there is a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah? There's a lot of forms to fill in. And people are very keen on changing the forms every two years. So finally you think how to do it, and then you have to do it again. I think a more serious thing is that multidisciplinarity is, is incredibly important. I'm a physicist, but I'm in the medicine department. But stimulating multidisciplinarity means that you, that you, you uh, reward that. And actually, that is something that is now lacking. For instance, if we are teaching in the physics department, if we have students from the physics department, those are the students we need. They can do the coding, they can do the mathematics and the statistics, but they're in the wrong school. And so, so uh, uh, rewarding that collaboration is, is not well arranged, and we should change that. And also, I think, is that classically the, the, the English universities are not very good in stimulating working as a group. People tend to be in their own office working on their own stuff, while our offices are always open and we always work together. And the university systems are not very good in rewarding that because all the metrics that we need to fulfill are scored as an individual and not really as a group. So I think that is something we, uh, we need to work on as well. And then, obviously, the Christie is amazing. We treat so many patients. We've got such beautiful kids. I haven't even talked about all the kids. But it is sluggish, and it comes with size. And it, it's, it's OK, but if we, it means that if we, if, we, if we get funding for a trial, just a trial on the hard data, we have to wait two years before it's open because of all the processes. And that means that by the time the trial is open, the grant funding has almost run out, but even worse, our competitors are also starting to do the same study, which is great because we need to share the information, but, but if we come up with the idea, it would be nice if we would get the results first. So that is important. 
And this is an actual picture of a notice that I found on a door, and you know, uh, somebody could just go around and put that notice everywhere because it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's 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 a great team to work in, and we have a lot of fun. And you know, thank you everybody for your collaboration. And and uh, Alan is not here because he has to do something with his kids, but he will join us later. And you know, he's amazing. So you know, but but everybody is amazing, and uh, it's so nice to work together. And obviously. I wouldn't be here without my family, so thank you to my family. You know, the, it has been a, a quite a large sacrifice moving from Holland to the UK, and with Brexit not helping because there was a lot of uncertainty. And I, I'm, I'm really, really happy uh, that they came along and support me. And it's taken them, my kids, a little while to settle in, and my wife a little while to settle in. It's okay now, but yeah, it is quite a, quite a significant sacrifice. And uh, I thank, thank you for that, and I, I did bring them. Uh, uh, some small gifts. <laughs> Oops. And with that, I would like to uh, end this presentation. Thank you very much.